So this is their uh, playoff game you know, tonight. It's, you it's not like the Spurs are going to rip off their last. Well, they might, but uh, I guess Portland could still fall below San Antonio if the Spurs win their last two games and the Blazers lose their last three games, or the Spurs win. And the but uh, you know, there's no reason the Blazers shouldn't at least try tonight. Yeah, but we'll we'll see. The Warriors right now one eight of nine. And we're talking about what's changed this season for the Golden State Warriors from a 19 and 24 start to a 25 and 11 run that they're on right now. And I just I think it's interesting that you know one of the themes again with with Steve Kerr has sometimes been that he doesn't play young guys yeah. or he hasn't played the young guys certainly during the dynasty and. This year, I think we can all agree the young guys have played more than they they have more than young guys have played ever under Steve yeah. Kerr. And and my question is, I know there's a lot of fans out there because I hear from some of them that that think Steve Kerr has been a little slow on the draw with that. Um, I, I actually and I, I look at the job Steve Kerr has done this year, and I think he's done a great job. I mean, I, I just think he's done an absolutely phenomenal job. I just wrote down a couple things here, Goo, that that he had that he did this year. Wow. That you know, some of the st- and I may have missed some because I just did it off the top of my head. But the f- remember the first thing he had to do, he had to convince us and him, meaning Chris Paul, that Chris Paul had to come off the bench. I forgot all about it. Chris Paul never came off the bench in his career. They acquired Chris Paul, and Chris Paul had to be a sixth man on this team and a professional. Um, exactly, he gave. The one thing that that Steve Kerr did is he absolutely positively gave gave Kavon Looney and Dario Saric the first crack at things in the front court, and he stuck with those guys for half the season. Saric was in the rotation. Looney was starting a good chunk of the time, oh, and then he made a change. You know what was it that he saw in Pajemski that that made Steve Kerr say, "You know what? I'm I'm going to get this guy some playing time from the first week of the season." And if you look at the Warriors, Pajemski's been a mainstay in terms of that rotation. Yeah. Sometimes starting, sometimes coming off the bench. How do you think Steve Kerr has handled Jonathan Kaminga this year, in his in his third year? Did Kaminga take the type of jump you wanted him to take? And we'll, obviously, he's still got some work to do with Kaminga. Goo. I'm, I'm just going to go all through yeah. these, and I'll, I'll let you jump yeah. in the end. Uh, uh, here's another part of the job. Steve Kerr in the media. I mean, it's a big part of the job. You send the message to the fans about what's going on with your team. Uh, is that part of it? Then he moved to Trey Jackson Davis. He started a rookie, second round pick. Um, he moved Clay Thompson to the bench at some point this season for fourteen to sixteen games. How did he handle the Wiggins situation, which was another delicate situation where Wiggins uh-huh. took some time off? What about Draymond Green, who had a uh, you know, sabbatical, er- erratic type of year. You like the way he handles Draymond Green. And then what about even just taking responsibility for a lot of the team's close losses early in the season? I kind of want to really get into and dive in deep with Steve Kerr this year and what kind of job you think he did. If you were, if you've been a critic of Steve Kerr, are you less of one now because he's integrated the young players or are you a critic of Steve Kerr and you're looking at this team saying maybe he should have done it earlier? Where, where are you at with Steve Kerr at 888-957-9570? Stiney, I love it, and I'd be a liar. And Chris M. called me out on YouTube. He didn't even call me out. He was like, Goo, remember that rant you went on about Kerr's handling of Kaminga? And I was banging on death saying, I want to see it. I want to see it. He should be playing. And this season, when they were five games under, it looked like it was – it was going the wrong way. So how can I, as a man, double back now and watch the strides, as we all have, of one Jonathan Kaminga and say that Steve Kerr, that was not the right formula. It was the right formula. Okay, exhibit A. Then pods. I got to be careful here. But remember when we talk about Brock Purdy and who were the two defensive players? Oh, it was Trent Williams and Kerr, uh, Fred Warner walking off uh, the practice field one summer day, and they whispered to each other and said, you know what, that kid's got it. There's something about that kid. This was way before he was even going to be starting. So 
Now, all of a sudden, I bring in Exhibit B, what Pods was doing in the summer camp or, you know, as a training camp where they were like he was going at Draymond Green if he missed an assignment or whatnot. And then Kerr trusted Pods to be able to pick up this high complex type of offense. And now he leads in plus minus. So that's another win for Kerr. Then you are right. You coaching. I thought this was going to be a dumpster fire. And it kind of started out as with no fire extinguisher when, when he was in Vegas, Chris, and, and that was making his rounds. He talked to Chris and whatever he said, Chris said, I'm going to be the pro and I'm going to be the six man. That worked out. And then for him to tell Willard and Dibbs, I had been a slave to the lineup that had got us, you know, four chips, but I went away from that. And then here comes TJD, Matt Steinmetz. I questioned Kerr, and I always said he was on my Mount Rushmore of all-time coaches, but I questioned him. And now when you bring this up, I almost, I sport melt, not tuna melt, I sport melt with this, I have to give him his flowers. So, Steiny, everything worked out, and now they're clicking and gelling at the most important time of the season. Yeah. If I'm that, being real. That's the way it looks. Yeah. That's the way it looks. Uh, this is an interesting point. And the, the clay. I left the clay. Yeah, go ahead. That, the clay one was the bit. That, there's no doubt, even if clay to this day feels like, I can't believe they moved me to the bench, that jump started him to get his groove back, right? We, I mean, we, it just looks like it. Yeah. I mean, where where are the Kerr critics right now? And there you go. I guess is what I'd, what I'd be asking. Uh, and what kind of year do you think that Steve Kerr had? Because when, when I do look at, when I look at the entire season and all the stuff that happened. You labeled a lot. You I, went through a lot. You know, I think, I think he's done a great job of managing it. I, you know, I think, I think coaching a team like the Warriors over 10 years when they're winning four titles I get it. It's a it's a great job. It's a great NBA job, but I don't necessarily think it's a it's an easy job when you have to do that. And I just I th- I think you know I've heard a lot of criticism over Steve about Steve Kerr over the years, and I've just kind of never really gotten it. And the reason I've never really gotten it is because I feel like we know what Steve Kerr is as a coach, and he's a coach who's going to rely on the guys that he trusts. He just is. He's not the kind of guy who wants to throw rookies out there and just have them play because every year the Warriors play, for the most part, they're playing for something. They didn't need them, so, the young guys. My, yeah, my feeling was always, you know, if you don't like Steve Kerr as as a coach of this team, then I think you got to get somebody else because we know what, we know what he is. We know, we know what he yeah. is, and we know the veterans – uh, believe in him and that they have the, the relationship between Kerr and the veterans is the most important relationship on the team. And Steve Kerr addressed it accordingly. And let's put a right on the table brought to you by Atco, Stani. I think mid December, early December, we were, before he got that extension, you know, we weren't saying it, but people were calling like, you know, the one thing Kerr doesn't do, he's does not he doesn't know how to handle the young players. And we didn't know and we we had conversations about it. I don't I don't need you to back me up, but you you were with me like people were calling in like, does this team need another coach? Was he coaching for his job? Is this team at a juncture now to where they need a new voice? And look how it's all played out, man. 888-957-9570 is the number. We're talking about Steve Kerr. Uh, we've gone through the, the, the roster for the last few weeks and, and kind of figured out where everybody is. And then we can also talk about the challenges that Kerr's going to face moving forward. And to me, the big one is, you know, how do you get Jonathan Kaminga back to how effective he was, maybe coming off the bench as he was when he was starting? Is that possible to get Jonathan Kaminga to play at the level he played as a starter when he's coming off the bench now, because I, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's etched in stone, but I don't think anybody mm. out there thinks Kaminga is going to jump back into the starting lineup anytime soon, which is fine. But then how do you maximize Kaminga coming off the bench? 888-957-9570 is the number. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Horace. Horace is in Texas. What's going on, Horace? How you doing? 
Oh, what's going on, fellas? You guys doing okay today? Yes, yes sir. The Lone Star State. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you know, I, I want to touch on the, I want to touch on the OJ thing, but uh, I also want to say something about, you know, the Warriors when it comes to. I hear a lot of people talking about who they want to play, who they want to avoid. You know, who you don't want to play this team in the first round. You don't want to play that team in the first round. Hey, listen. We need to get off of that because when you start trying to prefer this team as opposed to that team, you know what? You end up getting the team you wanted, and that's the team that does you in. So I think we Mm. need to just let, you know, quit talking like that and say, listen, we need to be prepared to play the team that is standing in front of us. I don't care if it's the Lakers. I don't care if it's Denver. I don't care if it's Sacramento, whoever it is, that's where your mindset needs to be. We're ready to play mm. whoever. And, I, and, I, and I, 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 I cringe when I hear people saying, ooh, I'd rather play this team. I want to play this team. Okay, you get what you wanted, and that's the, you know, that's the team that does you in. Quit doing that. <laughs> be no. ready for whoever you get. And if you're <laughs> supposed to go deep in the championship, yeah. if you're supposed to go deep in the playoffs, you should be able to beat whoever's in front of you anyway. If you're gonna, if you're supposed to really be the champion, you should be able to beat anybody in front of you. You know, yeah. So that's all I got to say about that. Now, as far as OJ is concerned, man, you got a mixed bag here, man. Yeah. You know, how, how do you, how do you approach it? How do you look at OJ? Man, you know, you had this wonderful football career, one of the greatest running backs to ever play the game. Then you got the acting career, the commercials. And then you got this murder thing. Oh, man, my goodness. Uh, uh, So it's like this. I can understand how people feel that, hey, he's guilty. I can understand how some people say, well, he's innocent. You weren't there, and you never know. And I can understand why some people might have the attitude, hey, I've seen all kinds of people get off, and you know they were guilty of sin, and they got off anyway. Why not him? I don't know how I feel about it, but there's one thing I can say is this. Miami's got the oranges, but Buffalo's got the juice. I remember that. I'm going to give you a three on I that. Remember wow. That. <laughs> little Howard Cosell from that uh, Horace ball, in Texas. That is a boy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, if you're just joining us uh, and you didn't miss, you didn't uh, hear the first segment, O.J. Simpson dead at uh, 76 years old, died of cancer. And we talked about it uh, in the first segment, and you know, it's, it's a tough thing to talk about. What was the I, offensive I, line's name? I got to uh, tell you, the electric company. I can't believe Spadoni. Had you heard that Spadoni? I had no, not. That's heard all that. time. Yeah, and I got a fact to wait. Turn on the juice. Yep, that's a that's a three. Exactly. Uh, did you know OJ was supposed to be the Terminator? It went to Schwarzenegger. I didn't know that. I'll be back, but uh, it's supposed to be OJ. Yeah. All right. Do you know why they didn't go with OJ as the uh, Terminator? Oh boy, I don't know. I don't. Careful. It's because uh, James Cameron did not think he would be a believable Bad character guy. as a killer. Wow. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I had heard that actually. Right. That now that rings a bell. And that's not a joke. That's like no, legit. Just, that's the- I get it. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. That was the thing about OJ. Everybody loved him. Yeah. Shout out Norberg. Pre nineteen ninety four. Naked gun. Some of the. Cl- I know you've seen that. Scotty. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Um, the scene of him on the boat. What's that? Scene of OJ on the boat and a naked <laughs> gun where he keeps like tripping over everything in the room. Less he like stuffs his toe on the stove, <laughs> bangs his head on the wall. He like touches the wet paint. Stop and it's just, it. That whole scene. Oh, is just, man. Oh, it's so great. Yeah. Wasn't he a pilot in one of the. Uh, Airplane movies Airplane, yeah. with uh, Leslie Airplane. Nielsen. <laughs> yeah, that's what I. That's those what I, are my but movies. So is Kareem stuff. Abdul-Jabbar. That was Kareem. Yeah, that was Kareem was the original Kareem. one. My but dad he was says in the Naked do. Gun. I mean, I'm sorry, he was in Airplane. No, not thinking Naked Gun. I think I think a Towering Inferno was the other one. That yeah, I think he might have been. Yeah. Remember Kareem said, okay. "Tell your dad you try to guard Lanier." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excuse me, stewardess. I speak jive. Ah, then when they went and said where basketball was invented, that was so racist. Let me stop. What's the uh, if you're for Warrior fans out there? What's been the biggest difference for you in this team from 19 and 24 to 25 and 11? Do do you pinpoint one thing, or do you think it's a bunch of things? And if it's more than one, 
I'm, I'd love to know what they are. Because if you think about it, like think, let's just do it from a logical standpoint. So Steph's been struggling a little the second half of the All season. Right. So this 25-11 and 11 run has actually occurred when Steph has not been carrying them. Mm. Steph was playing better when they were 19 and 24. So you could make a case that, man, if Steph doesn't play like he played the first half of the year, maybe they're 15 and 28 at that point. But could I make a case? Do I sound like I got Curry underwear? I'm going to throw it back to you. If I say just the gravity, even with Curry struggling, of him being out there, that's where the Warriors start. Always do. Always do. Uh, Ray's in Watsonville. What's up, Ray? How you doing, man? Hey, hey guys. Hey. A um, couple of things. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm going to yeah. talk into an area here. But anyhow, real quick, I think the biggest change uh, for the Warriors from from uh, previous times is the, uh, getting Chris Paul. And you think about it. We've had young draft picks before, and we thought that they would uh, uh, step yeah. right in, but they – but they never really, you know, did anything. Think about it. If we had Chris Paul last year, you think that we'd still have uh, a pull on the team? I think that uh, we may have. But also, thinking about, you know, because we, we've always heard that, okay, Draymond, Clay, and, and, and Curry, how, how were they mentoring the younger, younger guys? Mm-hmm. I think that they tried to, but they never really stuck. And you can see just Chris Paul being on the bench talking to the guys when he's out there on the second team. I never liked the guy, to be honest with you, but when he's on our team, man, I really appreciate everything that he's doing for the young kids and, and getting – because that's only going to benefit us going down the road when we don't have the other guys with us on the team. You yeah, can, real yeah, quick, I just want to yeah. jump on real quick. Hey, thank you. Sure. Oh, he I'm, That was a great call, Stanley. He has me thinking now who – who would have been a better steward than Chris Paul? And I don't want to take anything from Pods, Kaminga, because when Kaminga got on the floor, he wasn't starting. He was to unlock those guys and TJD, Stani. So what better vet to be the maestro, the conductor of, hey, I know where you like it, big fella. I'm a th-. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's a bonus in itself. I mean, damn. I mean, couldn't you make the case that that the Golden State Warriors, their original, you know, the big three, they just, they weren't great at mentoring. And in comes Chris Paul, who over the course of his 18-year career has played for championship contenders, but then he also, if you remember, got traded to Oklahoma City, where he found himself on a young team, not ready to win. I remember that. And what did he do? They went to the playoffs. He went out and he led that team of young players, even though he knew that he wasn't going to be able to get it done that year. So I, I think that's a good point. I mean, how m- maybe Chris Paul has a lot to do with this for being a bridge between Man. Curry, Clay, and Draymond and the young players. And let's be another rat, Stani. Yeah. His Curry, Clay, and Draymond were the second team. Chris Paul was out there with those guys. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, 888-957-9570. What grade are you giving Steve Kerr? Uh, this year, here's uh, here's my guy. He said Steiny. I'd give Kerr a B minus, a B minus for 2024 season because of the 10 seed. I think he's a top five NBA coach, but he wants to run with the dogs who got him there, not the young players. His forte is not player development. Well, can we really say that now? Well, I mean, I. I think a lot of people would agree with the four one five up until this year. Up until this year, I mean, the Warriors didn't develop a lot of young players because, to me, they didn't have good players to develop because they were constantly drafting 27, 28. Jordan Bale. And it's a crapshoot. Here's the other thing. Let's look back at the Chris Paul Jordan Poole trade. Good trade? It's a good trade? You happy with the trade? I'm happy for the trade now, but in four years, when Chris Paul, I've started, I, that's another, I know he's not coming back, but if there was a way to bring him back, I would want him back, but I'll, it's a good trade right now. Wait, bring who back? Chris Paul. Oh, okay. But I thought if, you meant Jordan Poole. But in three more years, if was... Poole is, you know, 16, 18 points, and a guy that could come off your bench, uh, I still miss him, Stein. He's playing better, but for right now, it worked out for the Warriors. Chris Paul is the adult in the room, man. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, YouTube chat. Josh Ram, great trade. Juan Cruz, absolutely. 
I mean, if you look at the way Poole played this year, I think you got to be okay with the trade. Yeah. Three, four years down the line, if, if Poole straightens himself yeah. out. And he's been playing better. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh,